This segment of tonight's show will look into one of the least understood aspects in Silicon Valley, the process of securing financing for mid-stage and late-stage companies. The data today show that it takes eight or nine years for the average startup to make it to an exit. And so if we're investing two or three years in, that would suggest we're kind of five, six years on average. But it takes a lot longer than that, more often than we'd like to admit. <laughs> you sometimes have issues where the value of the company is often tied up in the, the human resources. And as a result, it's not just about how much dollars you can get in terms of total sale price, but also what the contracts will look like um, for the team to stay on for you know, one, two, or three years afterwards. My name is Jim Connor. Welcome to Game Changers Silicon Valley. My guests are David Williams, founder of Williams Capital and investment banker, and Steve Bird, co-founder and partner at Focus Ventures, a late stage venture capital firm. David and Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, let me, th let me start with you. What does your firm as a late stage series C or D look for when you're considering making an investment at this, at this point? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. I, I think, first of all, there are three important things that we look for that are very much like all investors. We look for some sort of strong technology or, or other proprietary advantage. We look for a market that has the potential to grow fast and, and be big, and we look for a strong management team. I would suggest that most all venture capitalists look for those three things. The thing that makes us a little bit different is we also look for momentum. We're investing late enough that we expect the companies to have their products in the market, to begin to have some revenue, and we want to see some good traction with those revenues. Let me ask you one little follow-up then. Um, you're looking for growth and, and to accelerate growth, even at that late stage, because it seems to be that many companies have sort of matured out their marketplace. Yeah, well, those are the investments we would avoid. I mean, we are definitely looking for companies that have begun to have revenue shipments, but still have a long ways to go in terms of their growth path. So, David, um, let's have you give us an overview. What is the exact role of an investment banker in the, in the Silicon Valley or in the venture community? And what kind of relationships do you want to have with venture investors? Sure. Um, half the time we're doing capital raises and half the time we're doing M&A. Um, typically, it's for later stage companies. Um, when a company's doing a, a Series A, for example, or a Series B, they're usually going straight to the VCs. They don't need an investment banker to help them out with that. It's usually the companies that are already venture backed that are moving on to the Series C, D, E, um, or are looking to get acquired and do an M&A process um, that use us. And, and usually it's the VCs on the board that are uh, that are contacting us and asking for our help. What role does your company play in selecting the investment banker for the company, your portfolio company? Uh, you know, we try to be as helpful as we can. If it's a space that we've worked in before and we happen to know some bankers or a banker that would be good in that space, then we certainly make that recommendation. Other times it's not a space that we have a lot of familiarity with and so we have to rely on others on the board to, to make those suggestions. Mm -hmm. So David, you've done a lot of work in Asia. Uh, you were at Merrill Lynch for a long time and, and based in Asia, is that correct? Yeah, based oh. in Hong Kong. So did, that, did those relationships carry over to the work you're doing here in Silicon Valley that you're working primarily with Asian companies for acquiring? Yeah, about 75% uh, of the companies we represent, um, even though most of them are based here in the U.S. and in Silicon Valley, 75% uh, of the time the winning bidder comes from Asia, usually greater China, Korea, Japan. Let me ask you, is there a reason for that? I mean, a dominant, other than they just want the technology? There's... There's no one reason. Sometimes it's the technology. Um, for a while there, a lot of companies in China wanted to move their capital out. Um, these days, with more capital controls in place in China, what you're seeing is, is you know, deals that are still uh, more highly valued by the Asian players than the U.S. bidders. Um, but it tends to be more access to this market and uh, looking to have people on the ground here in the U.S. and access to the customers here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So, Steve, within your, your portfolio plan, if I can say that, what is the horizon? You know, a lot of companies, uh, early stage, Series A and B, will go, well, we're going to invest you know, up in the first five, six years and hopefully harvest the liquidations or exits. Mm -hmm. You're coming at such a late time. Do you have a shorter horizon in your... We do have a shorter horizon, but none of us are realistic. So we have to get over that problem right away. Uh, the data today show that it takes eight or nine years for the average mm -hmm. startup to make it to an exit. And so if we're investing two or three years in, that would suggest we're kind of five, six years on average. But it takes a lot longer than that more often than we'd like to admit. My perception, which could be wrong, mm -hmm. there's a cycle that a technology company that's growing and has a great product or market will get acquired roughly in three years. If they don't, they have to go out to seven or eight years or more 
to become a sustainable company on their own. Mm -hmm. Is that what you also see in the marketplace? Yeah, I think that's pretty accurate. Oh, yes. I, we would tend to see that as well, that, that you have technology stage acquisitions and those can happen in the first few years mm -hmm. and then you have business acquisitions and those usually take several years to mm -hmm. get developed. What is the acquisition experience that you go through? You're talking only large public companies or are you talking about middle market or even small caps? Almost always it's, it's large companies and we also do see several Asian players mm -hmm. who come in. Uh, there may be some examples where we've sold to smaller or mid cap companies but that's fairly rare. Mm -hmm. So David, when you're going through, you're at the other end, you're, you're, doing the, you're representing the south side company, correct? Mm -hmm and you're dealing with the, also the, the, the uh, investor base. How, what is your communication level and your relationship like with the company versus the investors? Um, typically, uh, when we're actually doing the deal, most of the work we do is with the management team, with the CEO, mm -hmm. CFO, et cetera. Um, but let's say once a month, twice a month, we're dealing with the board members, the investors, um, and reporting back to them on how the process is going. Do you ever get a situation where there's a split in the willingness to go forward or not between the management and the investors? Uh, yes, sometimes. Um, and, and certainly with early stage companies, uh, earlier stage companies, you yeah. sometimes have issues where the value of the company is often tied up in the, the human resources. And as a result, it's not just about how much dollars you can get in terms of total sale, sale price, but also what the contracts will look like um, for the team to stay on for you know, one, two or three years afterwards. So that may be an issue of the team getting an early exit or an exit, and then they just want to go off. They have to have some kind of ongoing contract to stay with the company. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, it's, you have to balance the interests. Uh, yeah. Investors would prefer, for their fiduciary duty reasons, to get the highest possible price. Um, mm -hmm. But you can't get the highest price if the management team won't sell, if, if they're required to stay on to make the deal happen. Back in your world, Steve, do you have that same issue come up periodically that the investors are willing to sell or vice versa and the company isn't? Yeah, usually it turns out it's the investors who are pushing towards sale and the management wants to hold on. Once in a while, it's the opposite of that. And when that happens, you know it's time to sell. Because if the management says we're ready, then you better be ready, whatever you think. Um, I, I would agree that there often aren't total agreement on that decision. And I would suggest that you really have to wait until there is agreement before you can do anything because the investors usually control the votes mm -hmm. but the management controls the people and unless you have both of those together I don't think you really get anything done so usually if you have a split that hasn't been resolved the answer is do nothing do until, nothing until you until you do have an agreement yes last money in has the bigger voice is that correct no no it is no I would say that's not correct okay I, I would say first of all in our business mm -hmm the health of our business really depends on us maintaining relationships not just with the management teams but also with the earlier stage investors because we want them to invite us into some of their more promising companies mm. and it almost is always the case that it's really the initial investors it's it's the the couple of folks who really got it started were the initial board members who typically maintain most of the control going on. Uh, what about a private equity round? I mean, would, would that change that mix a little bit where the private equity round had more control? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, w we haven't done that in any of our portfolio companies mm -hmm. at this point, but yes, if a big private equity firm comes in, they usually write very large checks, usually put some money in the company and buy out some initial shareholders, mm -hmm. and so they can wind up with a very strong control position. Mm -hmm. So, David, a lot of companies around here are very illiquid. I mean, the, the poor, uh, the founders have been working for years. They're making 150000 which in Silicon Valley doesn't go that far, maybe two hundred. Do you ever provide a means, or do you see how they have a way to get some liquidity uh, along the lines of what uh, Steve was talking about? Uh, it didn't used to be the case that you could do secondary for private companies like this, um, it, unless there was also primary being sold at the same time. But that's changed to some extent over the last few years. So you, there are certain funds out there that now uh, we'll go ahead and invest in purely secondary, sometimes common shares, which you know kind of bucks conventional wisdom, which is that professional investors wouldn't want those kind of shares. Well, Steve, you've got a tremendous amount of experience in several venture, uh, venture capital firms. Um, tell us about how you got started in the industry. You were an operator at one point, is that correct? Uh, well, that might be giving me too much of the benefit of the doubt. I was a consultant, actually. I worked for a consulting firm called Bain & Company. And my entry into the venture business was not intentional. It was more of an accident. I was uh, called by a firm who had just raised a new fund. They were looking for somebody who had an engineering and business background, and I happened to fit that mold, and I was off and running. So, David, you spent a number of years in Asia, again, Merrill Lynch and what have you. Um, how did you get into that part of the world? 
Uh, kind of a fluke. I had been with Solomon Brothers here in the U.S. and then um, uh, moved out there with Solomon and did telecom and media. And uh, Merrill Lynch hired me to set up their internet investment banking group for Asia and then the emerging markets worldwide. Um, it was in 99, I think. And so it turned out to be a good time, uh, right place, right time kind of thing. 99 was a pretty tough time in the U.S., but it was good in, in Asia. No, it correct? was good here, too. It was 2000 that things oh, got yeah, tough. Yeah, yeah. Right. and so, yeah, and then I, in 2000, I left and became a partner on the VC side with DFJ, ePlanet, and made some investments like Baidu out there. And then Merrill hired me back to Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. and then we started this firm about 16 years ago. So I do want to ask this. I know this company is kind of going through a similar situation, what you mentioned, which is they're looking to raise capital, but they'll sell. I mean, you, you're involved in that process, that type of process. Is that correct? Sure. In, in those kind of cases, usually it'll be structured as a fundraise, mm -hmm. and we'll go out to both financial and strategic investors, knowing that the strategic investors, if they're interested, will often come back and say, hey, no, we're not interested in just owning 10%. We'd like to acquire the company. So there'll be a few M&A discussions going on in parallel, but under the you know, kind of umbrella of a capital raise. Mm -hmm. So... I understand you're going to retire, looking to retire pretty soon. What's that all about? You're a young guy. You look like you're full oh, of energy. Oh, I'm very old, actually. Uh, why? I mean, you're having a great time running a fund, or is it, is it that the venture business has changed? I think it's a little bit of both. I actually am okay. older than you probably are nice enough to comment on. <laughs> okay. But um, in addition to that, I think the industry really has changed. When we started our firm 20 years ago, there was a fairly clear delineation between early stage investors and late stage investors. And we were able to form partnerships with some of the very best early stage firms. And that's part of the reason that I think we were so successful. Well, fast forward 20 years and now all of a sudden, the bigger firms, DFJ is an example, do everything. They mm -hmm. do early stage, late stage, offshore, onshore. And so we were getting into a position where we're actually competing more with some of the firms that we used to partner with. And so um, my partners are about the same age I am, both kind of where we were in our careers, in addition to the fact that there had been this pretty dramatic change in the way the industry was structured, made me decide it's time to uh -huh. think about something else. So, David, are you, do you see anything coming down new for you in the future? Is there any direction you're going to go? Are you going to stay the mainstream of both the uh, capital raise and Probably the, uh, stay the course for the next yeah. 15, 20 years. Yeah, 15, 20 years. Now, you're a really young guy, so you've got 15, 20 years I hope left. I hope I do. Huh? I hope I have that much time. We'll yeah. see. Great, great. Well, you guys have both been delightful. Um, I'll uh, ask each of you to give any contact information, if you'd like, for people who'd like to follow up with you. Sure. Our firm is Focus Ventures, mm -hmm. and we have a website, focusventures.com, and you can contact me or any of my partners on, on that web website. Very good, Steve. David? Uh, yeah, our firm is Williams Capital Advisors. Mm -hmm. The uh, website is williamscap.com, and uh, you can reach me or my partner, Jason Hathaway, or, or any of our other team. I want to thank both of you for coming in tonight. I really enjoyed this conversation. It's been very insightful because I literally did not quite understand the dynamic or the relationship between the investment banking community and the late stage venture community. It's all very interesting and I want to wish you every success going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. This is Jim Conner. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Game Changers Silicon Valley. Each week we'll address an area of innovation that may emerge as a game changer of tomorrow. We look forward to your continued interest and participation in upcoming shows. Mm -hmm.